the 9,424th meeting of the Security Council is called to order. The provisional agenda for this meeting is threats to international peace and security. The agenda is adopted. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's provisional rules of procedure, I invite the following briefers to participate in this meeting. Mr. Dirk Polman, journalist, and Mr. Jimmy Dor, political commentator. It is so decided. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of item two of the agenda. I now give the floor to Mr. Dirk Polman. Mr. President, uh, distinguished members of the Security Council, thank you for the chance to speak here. I'm Dirk Pullman, investigative journalist and documentary filmmaker for 37 years. I've written and directed more than 20 documentaries, mostly about intelligence operations of the Cold War, aired in approximately 30 countries and TV. I'm independent, I'm a freelancer, and I'm not on any payroll. I reported repeatedly about the Nord Stream sabotage and have contacted and interviewed many researchers on this. One year after this severe act of terrorism, we know astonishingly little. For example, we don't know how many explosions destroyed the allegedly four damage sites. Uh, we have seismic data for only two explosions at 0003 and 1704 UTC. We don't know who did it. I omit the Western-sponsored baseless conspiracy theory of Russia as the culprit. I think it is fair to say that the authorities in Germany, Denmark, Sweden, and other Western countries know enough to know that they don't want to know more. The truth would open Pandora's box for NATO. The version pushed in Germany via the media by the state, which itself is completely silent because of the quote, well-being of the state, which can be translated to national security, and because of the quote, third party rule on intelligence cooperation, is it was probably in Ukrainian operation using a sailing boat with six people on board, four divers, but without knowledge of the Ukrainian government. I trust this version as far as I can throw a washing machine. But there is actually new evidence which I want to present here. Professor Emeritus Dr. Ulla Tunanda, formerly Peace Research Institute Oslo, wrote to me on request addressing the location, uh, stressing that the location of the sabotage was at a very deep position of the pipeline where at, uh, 80 meters depth. In some distance to each side, the depth would have been 30 to 40 meters. Why was the deep location picked? Remember this info for later, please. Punanda wrote to me, and I quote him now, the explosives were deployed in the Bornholm Basin at a depth of 75 to 80 meters. Such deep dives require a decompression chamber. The story about a small sailing boat is impossible. It cannot bring the necessary decompression chamber. The depth indicates professional or military divers. Norwegian seismological station NASA states a magnitude of 2.1 to 2.3 of the explosion, which corresponds to 650 to 900 kilograms of TNT. Geophone Potsdam claimed that the magnitude was higher, 3.1, which would correspond to several tons of TNT. This operation would be impossible to run from a small sailing boat. Each section of the pipeline of steel of and concrete is 12 meters long and has a weight of 24 tons. About 250 meters of the pipeline Nord Stream string A and B have been blown away. It was a huge blast run by a state agency. When you do a huge professional operation, you firstly need a cover for the deployment of the bombs. And secondly, you need to disconnect the deployment from the triggering of the bombs. Otherwise, people would easily find out who the perpetrators are. The obvious cover was the Baltops 20T exercise in June 22, with 45 ships from various NATO countries. They exercised mine warfare with divers and unmanned underwater vehicles. U.S. ships like the small aircraft carrier USS Kearsarge, 257 meters, and USS Gunston Hall, 150, 190 meters, 
were both capable of bringing a midget submarine, which could have been useful for the deployment of explosives at such a depth. Remarked by me, the two ships can transport, deploy, and load mini subs back into the hull on high sea. I go on with uh, uh, Professor Tunanda. One witness as well as Seymour Hirsch have both claimed that US Navy divers with deep diving equipment from Panama City, Florida were present. They had nothing to do with the exercise. They have been very likely been used to deploy the bombs. Seymour Hirsch claims that they had dropped a sonar buoy from a P-8 Poseidon aircraft. The buoy had sent a coded signal that triggered the timers of the bombs. This is an easy and practical way to do it. Seymour Hirsch sources, supposedly from the CIA, also told him that the US had used a Norwegian Poseidon to pull the trigger. Americans like plausible deniability, but there is something we have to add. It might have been the US plan, but such an operation did not fit with traditional Norwegian security policy. So the Norwegians at a higher level seem to have backed out, contrary to the information Seymour Hirsch got. What happened instead, on 21st of September, a US Poseidon, and everything I quote now is new, flew from Sigonella, Italy, up to the Nordholz Navy airfield in Germany. That is an airfield from the Naval Aviation in Germany. And flew for three nights back and forth over Bornholm, 22nd to 25th September, and then on 26th September, back to Sigonella. It could have easily dropped a sooner boy over the sea close to Bornholm. If Hirsch was right, then the Norwegians were supposed to drop the sooner boy. The Americans at Sigonella would have to fetch it from Norway. So on 14 September, a US Hercules flew seven hours up from Sigonella to Andenes, northern Norway, and then back to Sigonella over Keflavik. We have reason to believe that the Hercules fetched something very important in Norway, a specific sonar boy, and brought it to Sigonella. Um, it also should be noted, this is not from uh, Tunanda, but from me now, that the Norwegians have bought P-8s and they are in the process of training the crews, uh, especially the uh, electronic warfare and submarine, anti-submarine warfare crews. So this is a, a mix of uh, people. It's not on the, on the record in Norway, but it can be used by Norway or it could be used by uh, the United States. That is a background information. Um, two hours before the first explosion, at 0003 UTC, a US Poseidon left Keflavik, Iceland for the waters east of Bornholm. It arrived at Bornholm one hour after the first explosion. At the same time of the explosion, strangely enough, exactly the minute when the US Poseidon was southwest of Norway, a US tanker aircraft left US Vandalem Air Base in Germany for Poland to refuel the Poseidon so it would be able to patrol the waters east of Bornholm for the upcoming four hours. It turned off its transponder at 0310 UTC and turned it on again three hours later, still east of Bornholm. At seven o'clock, the Poseidon flew over the site of the explosion for the last time, then climbed to an altitude of 10,000 meters and returned to Keflavik. I also asked Dr. Hans Benjamin Braun, an eminent Swiss physicist with many publications <clears throat> in top journals, who has been teaching as professor at some leading universities, and <clears throat> he stated the following. So far, the official reports all agreed on the fact that the pipelines were destroyed with an explosive charge equivalent to a few hundred kilograms of conventional explosive TNT equivalent. These reports are not only mutually contradictory, but also contradict basic physical considerations. Thus, in validating the hypothesis of the use of a conventional explosive. In contrast, several solid pieces of geophysical evidence, namely seismic waveforms, placement of explosives, aerosol cloud after explosion, underwater currents, temperature increase on ocean floor with concomitant reduced biomass production and gamma ray detection in Poland, point towards the use of an explosive charge at least a thousand times of what has been reported previously. These results have been presented in a detailed report initially submitted to the Swiss government on January 4th, 2023 by Professor Braun and its representation on the United Nations Security Council. Without going into details, I demonstrate here that the hypothesis of the use of a conventional explosive 
of moderate strength is already invalidated by close inspection of the official reports. In order to appreciate these contradictions, it should be noted that the mathematical relation between seismic magnitude on the Richter scale and explosive charge is a logarithmic one. A magnitude increase by one corresponds to a tenfold increase in seismic amplitude. So if you go from two to three, it's not linear, it's 10 times as much. And for underwater explosions to a 35 fold increase in explosive mass. The official reports on the magnitude of the larger explosion that destroyed Nord Stream 1 on Swedish territory go back to an original report by Norway's NORSA, as Tunanda stated, which reported an event of magnitude 2.1 on the Richter scale. This corresponds to approximately 700 kilograms of TNT equivalent. However, these data were presented without units on the graph. That is very rare. In a scientific uh, publication, no units on the graph without units and lacked scientific basis. Despite the serious shortcoming, an explosive change of this magnitude or less has been quoted in the media ever since. This is what we hear all the time, 500 to 900 kilograms. In contrast, the official entry into the seismic geophone database in magnitude 3.1 and thus 35 times larger than the previous estimate, corresponding to roughly 25 tons of TNT equivalent. As a much smaller explosive charge would have been sufficient to destroy the pipeline, this raises considerable, considerable doubts about the nature of the explosive charge used. This consider considerable amount of explosive charge has been placed on Nord Stream 1 at a location such that the elliptically shaped Swedish coastline acted as a focusing mirror for the emitted shockwave. Also, it was placed so that there was a direct and unobstructed connection between the site and the Kaliningrad coast through a submarine canyon. So there's something like a bowl in the ocean with a canyon uh, with a direction to Kaliningrad. Uh, if you recall Professor Tunanda's question um, why the sabotage was done in great depths, such a direct connection would not have been possible a few kilometers up or downstream along the Nord Stream pipeline. The location of the explosion site was designed to generate a shockwave directed at Kaliningrad. My remark probably is a message to the Russian government. Again, uh, Dr. Vaughan, this effect was missed in the official reports, which were restricted to seismic stations to the west of the explosion site in the, so, uh, in the shadow of Bornholm, so to speak. So the readings we have are from, uh, from in, in the back of Bornholm and lesser. In fact, a thorough evaluation of several seismic stations around the Baltic yields Richter magnitude 4, suggesting the use of at least 150 tons of TNT. This raises serious concerns about the nature of the explosive charge being used in the attack. These large seismic si signals have been attempted to be explained by the thrust of methane gas exiting from the destroyed pipeline. With the reported pressure, the speed of the resulting shock is significantly lower than the speed of sound and water, which is 1.5 kilometers per second. As a result, the existing methane, the exiting methane cannot explain the observed magnitudes in the Baltic Sea. There are reports of technogenic craters of depth three to five uh, meters depth. Several independent reports have related crater size to explosive weight, including nuclear underwater explosions. Also here, a rough estimate of explosive charge yields at least 20 to 150 tons of TNT, again invalidating the hypothesis of a small amount of conventional explosive. These facts about the explosion that destroyed Nord Stream 1, together with the independent geophysical observations, are inconsistent with the reported use of a conventional explosive of a few hundred kilograms. The observations are rather consistent with an explosive charge of one to four kilotons TNT equivalent. In an earlier report from December 31, 22, Dr. Braun elaborated on a total of seven independent geophysical observations that are at variance with the reported use of a moderate explosive. The quantitative estimate places a strict lower bound on the explosive charge of 150 tons TNT, which is at least 400 times the value of the official reports. The current findings are of high importance as reflected by the statement by one of the reviewers 
quote, the scientific results are relevant for current international affairs and warrant urgent reporting, end of quote. In view of the seriousness of the matter, it is important that independent and objective evidence is secured, which requires the authority of the UN Security Council. An absence of action puts humanity at large at risk. Dr. Brown, uh, again, for further details of my analysis, I refer to my recent presentations and my report, which has already been forwarded to the Swiss government and its representation to the UN Security Council on January 4, 23. Dr. Braun has offered the Security Council to present him in an in, in-depth analysis of deep in detail and offers it again hereby through me. Now a remark from me. The Baltic seabed is packed with hydrophones. The Western navies can identify every vessel in and on the surface of the Baltic since the late 70s. Um, the propellers create something like a fingerprint. A German TV crew filming a 30-minute report with the allegedly used Andromeda sailing yacht with an ominous soundtrack should have recorded the sound of the motor and the propeller of Andromeda, which has been used allegedly at the sabotage site, and it, the motor must have been used to keep the ship's position. And then the crew should have asked the NATO navies to check if Andromeda was there at the right time at the site of the explosion. I would also like to remark Soviet pipelines have been a source for Western intelligence operations before. Enrico Mattei, the most successful Italian oil manager and head of INI, was killed in the crash of his private jet in 1962. He was hated by the US mineral oil industry for his immense business success in the North African countries. In a memo to the CIA, they called him, the mineral oil industry US, called him as, quote, an even greater villain than the Soviet Union when he arranged the up to then biggest business deal in Italy with the USSR a barter agreement to build pipelines for Italy for Soviet oil. In 1997, it was proven that the crash was not due to bad weather, as told before, as there were metal splinters found in his exhumed bones, the effect of a bomb in the jet. In 1982, the CIA destroyed the Yamal pipeline with malfunctioning ships infiltrated into the USSR in an elaborate intelligence operation. The former Secretary of the Air Force, Thomas Reed, told me in an interview how he witnessed, as a member of the U.S. National Security Council, the message that a three kiloton burst was recorded in the USSR. And a CIA official told them that the biggest conventional explosion ever was the result of a CIA operation, not a nuclear warhead of the USSR. It was just one of a string of operations against the Yamal pipeline. When the Social Democratic German Chancellor Helmut Schmidt insisted on the gas pipeline deal in the early 80s to secure cheap Soviet gas for Europe, although Reagan had told him in a, uh, to stop the contract in a one-on-one -on -one meeting, Schmidt looking out of the window while Reagan spoke to him, it meant he fell from grace. The conservative Helmut Kohl became the new Chancellor of Germany without an election by an allegedly US-assisted vote of no confidence in Germany in the parliament. Latest when it comes to Russian gas, the US has no allies but hostages. On top of that, some hostages suffer from Stockholm syndrome, like the current Swedish and German governments. Thank you. I thank Mr. Pornman for his briefing. I now give the floor to Mr. Jimmy Dore. Greetings, Mr. President, distinguished members of the council. I'm here to speak today about the attack on the Nord Stream pipeline that took place one year ago on September 26, 2022. Four explosions ruptured the Nord Stream 1 and 2 pipelines that carried natural gas from Russia to Europe. It was the biggest act of industrial sabotage in human history, severing the main artery for energy from Russia to Germany, cheap energy that was critical to maintaining Germany's industrial base. We have heard every cockamamian ridiculous theory on how this happened. Now, you don't need to be a genius investigative reporter to figure out who is the culprit of the Nord Stream attack. Incredibly, most Western news outlets ignore the fact that the President of the United States, Joe Biden himself, announced on February 9th, 2022, that he would, in fact, attack the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, saying, and I quote, if Russia invades Ukraine, tanks crossing the border again, there will no longer be a Nord Stream 2 pipeline. 
we will bring an end to it, I promise you, we will be able to do it. Even with that pre-admission of guilt from the President of the United States, most of the Western press remained baffled as to who could have pulled off the greatest act of eco-terrorism in history. But luckily, we don't have to rely on my interpretation of President Biden's clear threat to attack the pipelines. We actually have Seymour Hersh, a genius investigative reporter with impeccable reputation and credentials, who reported that in June of 2022, United States Navy divers operating under the cover of a widely publicized summer NATO exercise known as Ball Tops 22, planted the remotely triggered explosives that three months later destroyed three of the four Nord Stream pipelines, according to a source with direct knowledge of the operational planning. And like all criminals, the perpetrators could not contain their elation over committing the crime. Shortly after the attack, many high-ranking U.S. officials could not help but brag about their achievements and expressed multiple times how they were proud of being able to put an end to the pipelines. Under Secretary of State Victoria Newland said, I am, and I think the administration is, very gratified to know that Nord Stream 2 is now, as you like to say, a hunk of metal at the bottom of the sea. United, the United States Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, called it a tremendous opportunity to once and for all remove the dependence on Russian energy. You have to be a paid liar to not acknowledge the hand of the United States in carrying out these attacks. Not only did President Biden declare he would do this, but high-ranking U.S. officials have said similar things for years. We can look to 2014 when former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice stated that over the long run, you simply want to change the structure of energy dependence. You want to depend more on North American energy platforms, which is what this is really all about, an economic war between the West and Russia in order to fill the pockets of rapacious capitalists who actually pull the strings of the US government and dictate foreign policy. So let's pull back and take a look at the context in which this pipeline bombing occurred, shall we? It's all happening under the guise of uh, defending Ukraine from an unprovoked Russian invasion. But of course, that's only true if you start the story of the Ukraine war somewhere near the end of the story instead of the beginning which would indict Ukraine, the U.S., and NATO. The U.S. and NATO are to blame, which is why the Western media always leaves the origin of this conflict out of their coverage and leaves most people in the dark with a false version of the cause of the conflict. Most Americans believe that Vladimir Putin woke up one day and decided for no particular reason to invade Ukraine and start a war completely out of the blue. This is what supporters of the Ukraine in, the, in this war actually believe because that's the only narrative they hear from their news media, which is funded by the people who profit off this war, the military industrial complex, the fossil fuel companies in the West, and of course, Wall Street. To make a crude analogy of the Western media's coverage of the Russian invasion is the following. Let's say Vladimir Putin was standing on a bus stop and there was an old lady standing in the street and a bus was heading straight for her. So Vladimir Putin pushes the old lady out of the way of the oncoming bus and down onto the concrete sidewalk. The Western corporate media would start that story near the end saying, Russian president pushes old lady down onto the concrete. The same goes for the entirety of the Ukraine-Russian war. The Western media starts the story of the war at February 24th, 2022, which is Definitely not when this conflict started. They leave out the 2014 coup of the democratically elected Ukraine government orchestrated by the CIA in conjunction with Ukraine Nazis. They leave out the fact that the Russian-speaking ethnic population in the eastern part of Ukraine, known as the Donbass, didn't want to go along with the CIA Nazi coup government. And so the newly coup right-wing Ukraine government started shelling the citizens of the Donbass 
via their henchmen known as the Nazi Azov Battalion that ended up killing somewhere around 18,000 civilians in the Donbass. They leave out also, there was a peace agreement that was reached to end the shelling by the Ukraine government and the Nazi Azov Battalion known as the Minsk Accord because the people who broke that peace agreement was not Russia, but the Ukraine government and the Nazis. They leave out the fact that there was already an overall peaceful way to avoid, avoid war and the slaughter of hundreds of thousands of precious Ukrainians, which was recently admitted to by the uh, Secretary General of NATO, who admitted that it was the expansion of NATO onto Russia's border that was the real prevarication and the U.S. and NATO refused to stop their expansion onto Russia's border. All this amnesia is necessary for the continued aggression and warmongering of the U.S. and NATO to be accepted by the citizens of the United States and Europe. Well, I'm here to cure them of their amnesia and remind them of the true cause of not only the Nord Stream bombing, but of the entire Ukraine war and the destabilization of the Middle East, including Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria. The reason for that is the imperialistic lust of the United States empire. The U.S. now has over 800 military bases around the world without being able to cite an actual threat to their sovereignty. The U.S. is now ending its empire the way all empires end, by overextending itself militarily while it starves its own people at home. The real threat is the threat of U.S. economic interests. The U.S. has for decades feared German engineering and capital joining Russia's natural resources and manpower. As elucidated very clearly by the founder of the U.S. intelligence firm Stratford, George Friedman in his 2010 book says, quote, Russia does not threaten America's global position. But the mere possibility that it might collaborate with Europe and particularly Germany opens up the most significant threat in a decade, a long-term threat that needs to be nipped in the bud. Therefore, maintaining a powerful wedge between Germany and Russia is of overwhelming interest to the United States. For the U.S., Friedman added in 2015, the primordial, the primordial fear is German technology and German capital, combining with Russian natural resources and Russian manpower to form the only combination that has for centuries scared the hell out of the United States. In this showdown, the US aims to control the line from the Baltics to the Black Sea. Russia, by contrast, must have at least a neutral Ukraine, not a pro-Western Ukraine, because a neutral Ukraine would impede the primordially, primordial U.S. goal of a Russian-German fissure. The U.S. has opted for a proxy war instead. The Western governments are silent, even as the U.S. says through anonymous sources that Ukraine is responsible for the Nord Stream attack, but they won't blame them publicly and so the United States continues to arm Ukraine to the teeth in hopes of extending the war and avoiding peace. The Germans say it's Ukraine, but will not release their official investigation and will not make an announcement. The final obscenity is that the people in the West who claim to be environmentalists and claim to care about climate change and the environment say nothing about the worst release of methane gas in human history, but in fact, whose actions reveal they don't actually care about climate change and continue to support this war and its echo terrorism. In a bizarre twist, even Greta Thunberg traveled to Ukraine to meet with Zelensky after the Nord Stream bombing. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I thank Ms. Dorr for his briefing. I now give the floor to those members of the Security Council who wish to make statements. I give the floor to the representative of Russian Federation. Madam President, we thank Dirk Pullman and Jimmy Dorr for their briefings, which have once again demonstrated to the Security Council that the citizens of Western countries also have a great deal of questions for their governments 
amid the numerous inconsistencies in the narrative promoted by Washington and its allies in connection with the bombing of the Nord Stream gas pipelines in September 2022. Dear colleagues, exactly a year has passed since the act of sabotage in the Baltic Sea. Nearly as much time has passed since the first Security Council meeting on this topic. Over the past 12 months, we have heard a great deal about how the national investigations carried out by Germany, Denmark, and Sweden are about to find the culprits of this crime any day now. However, there have been no results so far, nor are there any to this day, despite seven meetings of the Security Council on this topic, both open and closed meetings. At the same time, more and more evidence is emerging in the expert community showing that the Nord Stream explosion is the work of Washington, which stooped to committing this outrageous crime guided by a narrow, selfish desire to consolidate its dominance in Europe, which is in dire need of Russian energy resources. Today's sad anniversary is an excellent opportunity to briefly recall the timeline of events. Let me remind you of the key points. As early as September 28th, immediately after the sabotage, the Prosecutor General's Office of Russia opened a criminal case under the article relating, relating to acts of international terrorism. Denmark and Sweden had indicated in their letter to the UN Security Council on September 29th that the Nord Streams were dis destroyed by explosive devices. This seems to have been the only specific conclusion we have heard in all this time. However, the German Prosecutor General's Office began its official investigation only on October 10th. In October 2022, communiques were sent from the Chairman of the Government of the Russian Federation, Mikhail Mishustin, to Berlin, Copenhagen, and Stockholm on the need to conduct a comprehensive investigation of the events with the participation of representatives of Russian authorities and the Gazprom Corporation. There have been no responses to these letters over the past year. In November, the Russian Prosecutor General's Office sent requests to German, Danish, and Swedish competent authorities to provide legal assistance and form joint investigative teams. In response, we received only boilerplate non-answers. Council's members have had the opportunity to see this with their own eyes when, in March, we disseminated copies of our correspondence with the authorities of these countries. Given this unacceptable situation, the Russian Federation submitted a draft resolution to the UN Security Council requesting that the UN Secretary General present proposals for the establishment of an independent international commission to investigate this act of sabotage. Tomorrow will be exactly six months since that resolution was voted on. Its text was completely depoliticized. It took into account all the specific comments and proposals made by council members during informal consultations, which lasted an entire month. However, it was not adopted. Let me to recall that the main arguments made by those colleagues who abstained during the vote was their so-called full confidence in the national investigations being carried out by the authorities of Germany, Denmark, and Sweden. Well, it has now been six months once again, and there are still no results. And this is despite the fact that concern over the lack of any sort of intelligible news from Berlin, Copenhagen, and Stockholm for such a long time has been expressed not only by Russia, China, and Brazil, who called for an investigation in March, but also by a number of other council members. What's more... In a clear show of disrespect for the Council, Germany, Denmark, and Sweden ignored the request to speak at the UN Security Council meeting on July 11th and limited themselves to disseminating yet another letter. And the letter very openly acknowledged that the ongoing investigations may not lead to any results or conclusions at all. I would like to ask our colleagues who so zealously support these national investigations what is the point of holding back the collective efforts of the council, uh, of council members, if these countries themselves have doubts as to the effectiveness of the work they are undertaking? All this looks very much like an imitation of vigorous activity and an attempt to deprive council members of access to information that is directly related to the maintenance of international peace and security. Madam President, I would like to remind you that we're not talking about some prank carried out by hooligans. We are talking about a terrorist act that targeted international pipeline infrastructure and led 
to massive economic and environmental consequences for a number of states. No one denies that it was committed using an explosive device. Therefore, there is every reason to believe that it falls under the International Convention for the Suppression of Terrorist Bombings of December 15, 1997, to which Germany, Denmark, and Sweden are all parties. This international legal instrument clearly states the obligations of its parties to investigate relevant crimes, to extradite or prosecute perpetrators, as well as to provide each other with the utmost assistance in connection with investigations, prosecutions, uh, or extradition proceedings. The authorities of the three aforementioned states continue to ignore these obligations. The words of German Chancellor Olaf Scholz about the intention to see the matter through are strikingly at odds with the matter itself, given the total lack of relevant information. Moreover, there are increasing signs that instead of efforts to clear up uh, the circumstances of what happened, we're actually seeing an attempt to conceal those circumstances. Thus, a coordinated campaign to promote completely ridiculous versions of events is getting ground in Western media. What haven't we heard over the past year? that Russia itself blew up a gas pipeline that was operating in its interests, that this was done by some tourists on a sailing yacht who, according to one version, acted practically on their own without any state support, and according to another version, acted on the orders of the commander-in-chief of the armed forces of Ukraine, Zaluzhny, but in complete secret from his immediate superior, President Zelensky. Even more ridiculous are reports published in some European media about Western intelligence services, including that of the US, supposedly being aware of the Ukrainians' plans and even attempting to dissuade them from carrying them through, but with no luck. Yet when we look at the rejection of the peace treaty with Russia in March 2022, it is clear that the authorities in Kiev cannot go against the will of their Western backers on such a serious issue. Dear colleagues, it is hard not to notice what all these versions have in common. Each of them denies Washington's involvement in the commission of this crime, and they all began to spread out like mushrooms after a spring rain soon after a major investigation by American journalist and Pulitzer Prize winner Seymour Hersh was published earlier this year, which briefers have already spoken about. That investigation provided a large number of facts, demonstrated that the explosives were planted on the North Stream branches by American divers during the NATO Balt Ops exercises in the summer of 2022. And today, by the way, he published new materials in support of this version. They show that the explosion was meticulously planned over several months and thought was given over uh, to how to cover up the tracks of the attack. I recommend that all members carefully of the council carefully study its conclusions. We all also remember the words of President Biden that there will no longer be a Nord Stream 2. We will bring an end to it, as he said during a press conference with German Chancellor Schultz during uh, February 2022. We also remember the open joy of Deputy Secretary of State Victoria Newland over the fact that the gas pipeline was, in her own words, now a hunk of metal at the bottom of the sea, which she said during a Senate hearing on January 26, 2023. We also remember the gratitude to the U.S. for blowing up the Nord Stream expressed on Twitter by former Polish full and minute Foreign Minister Radoslaw Sikorski. Let us also not forget how some Western members of the Council unable to control their emotions, directly pointed out at council meetings that the Nord Stream explosions were a response to Russia's actions in Ukraine. Such sincere confessions would make this an open and shut case even for a novice investigator. But since the goal of Germany, Denmark and Sweden is to cover up the involvement of their overseas big brother, the investigators there have their hands tied and their eyes blindfolded. Therefore, as Seymour Hirsch has told us, following the meeting between Joe Biden and Olaf Scholz, the American and German intelligence services were instructed to come up with alternative versions of the events and gradually leak them to the media. And that is exactly what they are doing now. 
only they're ending up with painfully implausible fabrications and leaks about the actual details of the tragedy are not making this any easier for Western storytellers. We can in particular recall the publicly available letter from the State Secretary of the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate of Germany, uh, Greichen, to the Bundestag leftist deputy Nastic from October 7th, 2022. That letter s indicates that even before the start of the investigation, German authorities had received intelligence information publishing which could have allegedly ha harmed the state interests of Germany. I wonder what kind of information could cause damage to a party that has allegedly suffered along with Russia in this. Whatever it may be, this once again shows that Western investigators are not interested in the truth. Rather, it is getting in their way. So what do we have now, Mr. President, a year after the terrorist attack? We have threats from senior UN officials regarding the functioning of this cross-border undersea gas pipeline. After this, we have its bombing as a result of an act of international terrorism entailing dangerous consequences for international peace and security, the economy, environment, and navigation in the Black Sea. We have the open jubilation of senior representatives of the American and pro-American establishments, the resistance of Western states to the idea of launching an impartial and inclusive international effort under the auspices of the Secretary General, the obvious ineffectiveness of the German, Swedish, and Danish national investigations, and at the same time, an attempt to ramp up narratives in the press in order to shift the blame to anyone other than the US and have something anything with which to counter objective facts. In such a situation, I hesitate to even use the cliche, draw your own conclusions. If anyone does still have any illusions remaining, then now, a year later, it is probably worth letting go of them. Madam President, I have no doubt that today we will once again hear from our Western colleagues that Russia is allegedly distracting the Council from more serious issues by insisting on discussing the terrorist attacks against the Nord Streams. Their tactic is a simple and clear one. namely to drag things out ideally for another year or two or three and then to say that it is impossible to continue the investigation due to the statute of limitations we suggest that they not waste any time or effort on this any such attempts are doomed to fail our country will continue to push for an objective and thorough investigation and so the full circumstances of what happened with the mandatory involvement of russian investigative authorities and all interested parties it will insist on bringing those who ordered and executed this act of sabotage to justice, and we will use all the means at our disposal for this, including in the Security Council. As part of this effort, our country intends to submit a draft presidential statement on this issue for the consideration of the Council. We will present the text in the coming days. We believe that the Security Council should speak out clearly regarding this terrorist act and point out for the need, the need for an objective investigation and accountability for those responsible. We trust on the su support of all those who understand that otherwise any country could become a victim of such an attack committed by a state that is utterly intoxicated with the sense of its own impunity. The Security Council must send a clear message that crimes against cross-border pipeline infrastructure aren't acceptable and that avoiding responsibility for such crimes is impossible. Only this will prevent their recurrence. I thank you. I thank the representative of Russian Federation for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of Japan. Thank you, Madam President. I thank the briefers for their remarks. Madam President, energy is a cornerstone of modern life and the reliable supply of natural gas is crucial. Given the height, height, heightened fragility of the global energy landscape, acts that danger, endanger critical infrastructure pose a significant risk to many. With this backdrop, Japan is acutely alarmed by the incident concerning the Nord Stream pipelines, as well as its long-term environmental implications. Madam President, 
We are vigilantly following the investigations led by the governments of Germany, Sweden, and Denmark. We have faith that these will be executed with the utmost fairness. We trust that the outcomes of these national investigations be made public in a transparent manner and reported explicitly to the Security Council. The Council bears the responsibility to address the issues affecting, affecting international peace and security. In order to fulfill such a function, the Council needs to have facts before it. Japan looks forward to seeing the results of the investigations by the national authorities. I thank you. I thank the representative of Japan for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of Brazil. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, dear colleagues, I thank the presidency for holding this meeting on an important pending issue. The explosions in the Nord Stream 1 and 2 gas pipelines caused enormous economic losses, contributed to aggravate international tensions and heightened geopolitical uncertainty in the region. Any attack to a massive energy infrastructure is bound to have a profound impact on how international actors perceive the security of their own critical assets. It is also disconcerting to witness the insufficient attention paid to the environmental impacts of the explosions. It stands in stark contrast to the readiness of many nations to assign blame when incidents occur in other regions of the globe. It is important and urgent to determine the causes of this incident. Brazil has expressed on numerous occasions its confidence in the investigations conducted by national authorities of Denmark, Germany, and Sweden. We do so again today and reiterate our support for the conduct of the procedures without external interference. At the same time, we believe that the seriousness of the episode, a clear threat to international peace and security, requires transparent and timely disclosure of at least preliminary conclusions of those investigations. Lack of reliable information leaves ample room for speculation and accusations, including those related to the war in Ukraine. It only feeds already very high tensions. We certainly do not need to aggravate them. Thank you. I thank the representative of Brazil for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of Gabon. Thank you. We are meeting once again today on the question of the sabotage of the Nord Stream 1 and 2 pipelines in the Baltic Sea on the 26th and 27th of September 2022. These were malicious acts against energy infrastructure, which triggered the indignation and condemnation of the members of this council. The extent of the material damage and the repercussions on the environment resulting from these undersea explosions, as well as the economic losses in the short term following the precautionary measures taken on navigation and overflight, but also long-term losses resulting from the fact that facilities were out of operation. These are significant consequences and result in legitimately high hopes for the conclusions of the investigations underway. The Security Council still is still awaiting the report of the joint investigation and there is a justified expectation that the investigation will shed light on the true circumstances around these acts and their perpetrators. A year since the events, the lack of progress on this file stokes all kinds of suspicions and speculation which tend to call into question the desire of the parties to conclude the investigations. In this regard, my country calls upon all parties to engage in a inclusive, transparent and depoliticized dynamic. It goes without saying that any hindrance or opacity around the process of the investigation would jeopardize their credibility and jeopardize trust in the current context. It is important that cooperation and exchange of information should prevail over all other considerations so as to promote the revelation of the truth. 
Thank you very much. I thank the representative of Gabon for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of Ecuador. Gracias. Uh... Thank you, Madam President. I listened carefully to the briefers. Upon the first anniversary of the explosions in the Nord Stream 1 and 2 pipelines in the Baltic Sea, and given that these were acts of sabotage, I wish to reiterate the fact that my delegation rejects this event. There can be no justification for attacks against essential civilian infrastructure, including energy infrastructure. We deplore the fact that these acts jeopardize the security of sea and sea and air navigation. On several occasions, we have deplored the environmental impact caused by these acts. They resulted in an incalculable source of pollution for marine life with possible climate consequences. Since hundreds of millions of cubic meters of gas were released into the atmosphere. Moreover, we have underscored our concern because acts such as this one happening during a global geopolitical situation which is extremely complex, uh, such acts exacerbate tensions and could trigger unpredictable consequences. We therefore also continue to call upon states to avoid speculation and to exercise maximum restraint. Ecuador will continue to be guided by the information provided in the past in this council by Under Secretary General Rosemary Di Carlo, who appealed for an avoidance of disruptive actions which affect, which could affect or inhibit attempts to seek the truth. The information provided by Sweden, Germany and Denmark contained within document S slash 2023 slash 517, which was circulated just over two months ago, reflects the complex nature of the national investigations underway, which involve technical, scientific and logistical elements inter alia. I wish therefore to reiterate the importance of the investigations underway continuing to progress in line with the fundamental principles of the rule of law. Thank you very much. And the representative of, of Ecuador for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of Switzerland. Merci, Madame la Thank you, Madam President. I take note of the statements of Mr. Poland and Mr. Doerr. Our assessment remains unchanged. I reiterate Switzerland's concern over the alleged acts of sabotage against the Nord Stream 1 and 2 gas pipelines, which led to gas leaks last September. Switzerland condemns all acts of sabotage against critical infrastructure, including energy infrastructure. Such actions can have harmful consequences for the supply of the population's economy, the economy and the environment. With regard to the investigations carried out by the national authorities, we welcome the information provided in the joint letter from Denmark, Germany and Sweden dated July 10th. As indicated in this letter, the respective national investigations are ongoing in order to shed light on the facts. We await their conclusions. I thank you. I thank the representative of Switzerland for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of China. Madam President, today marks the first anniversary of the explosion of the Nord Stream pipelines. Since the incident, the international community has been paying great attention to it, and many members of the Security Council, including China, have repeatedly called for an objective, impartial and professional investigation to find out the truth as soon as possible. Regretfully, to date, there is still no clear and authoritative conclusion on this matter. The Nord Stream pipeline explosion bears on the safety of transnational infrastructure and has a negative impact on global energy supply, marine environment, and the safety of maritime shipping. Countries concerned have been conducting national investigations for quite some time. Yet, the result remains elusive. 
The longer the delay, the more difficult it will be to collect evidence and uncover the truth, the more doubts and speculations it will arouse, and the less credible the results of the investigations will be. We hope that countries concerned will proactively respond to concerns of the international community with a heightened sense of urgency, announce progress updates of the investigations in a timely manner and with a responsible attitude towards regional security and development and ensure that the conclusions are objective, impartial, authoritative that can stand the test of history. Russia is one of the main parties involved in the explosion. We call on countries concerned to actively communicate and cooperate with Russia rather than simply rejecting it. Any attempt to politicize the investigation would only create suspicion and cause more speculations. On the Nord Stream issue, the international community, including the Security Council, should refrain from applying double standards. We hope to see the truth uncovered and perpetrators brought to justice at an early date. We also hope the Secretariat will provide more useful information and the Council will remain seized of the matter. Thank you, President. I thank the representative of China for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of Malta. Thank you, Madam President. Malta reiterates its strong condemnation at the possible act of sabotage targeting the Nord Stream 1 and 2 pipelines that occurred in September 2022. Such actions pose a serious threat to energy security and regional stability. Our position against any form of disruption to critical energy infrastructure is a clear and long-standing one. The subsequent leaks have also presented a substantial threat to the nations directly involved and to the environment. They have compromised a critical conduit for the transportation of a crucial energy resource. They have exacerbated the challenges faced by developing nations and global energy markets already strained as a consequence of Russia's aggression against Ukraine. This incident serves as a stark reminder of the vulnerabilities inherent to essential energy infrastructure. On 10 July, Denmark, Germany and Sweden sent another joint letter to the Security Council regarding the status of ongoing investigations into the explosions. In the same letter, they reiterated their commitment to investigating the sabotage comprehensively. This Council cannot ignore the fact that the nature of these acts is unprecedented. Investigations are complex, and this is something that we should all be able to agree to and acknowledge. Meanwhile, Malta has no reason to believe that they are not being conducted meticulously, in line with the fundamental principles of the rule of law and independent from political interference. We reiterate our full confidence in their impartiality and credibility. Persistent claims that enough time has paused to establish the truth are groundless. Such speculation only creates distrust and suspicion among states. Furthermore, the countries in question have all the necessary means, resources and expertise to conduct their own investigations. Introducing further investigations at this juncture seriously risks being counterproductive. I thank you, Madam President. I thank the representative of Malta for their statement. I give the floor to the representative of United Kingdom. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you to the briefers for their perspective.